Hello, I'm Nina Vias, and I'm a postdoc at the B24 beamline at Diamond Life Source. Here we have two techniques for imaging biological samples, cryosoft x-ray tomography and cryostructured illumination microscopy. In this talk, I'll focus on a protocol we've developed for effectively correlating data sets from these two modalities. I'll first give some background about the two imaging techniques and the workflow that's been developed for users here at the B24 Beamline. I'll then show the process that we use to correlate the images using open source software. We use ECCLEM in IC. And then I'll give some examples of the kind of research that's possible using these techniques. And finally, some tips on how to achieve successful correlation by optimising the experimental process. Cryosoft X-ray tomography is a method of imaging the ultrastructure of cells in 3D. It fills the resolution gap between light microscopy and electron tomography, and it has the advantage that cells can be imaged whole without staining, so the sample preparation is also easier, and it preserves the cells in a near-native state without any artefacts caused by staining or sectioning. We can image with energies between 284 eV and 543 eV. At these energies, we don't need to stain the sample because water is transparent to the x-rays. It's called the water window. And there's natural absorption contrast from carbon-rich biological structures. We collect 3D tilt series data as a series of x-ray projection images, which are taken as the sample is rotated. This is then reconstructed to produce an X-ray tomogram. And this is an X-ray tomogram of a lung epithelial cell. You can see the boundary between two cells here. And you can also see mitochondria as well as the ER and vesicles. CryoSXT is used for imaging the ultrastructure of mammalian cells as well as yeast bacteria and also viruses and we can investigate different processes such as virus host interactions or cell motility. Cryofluorescence microscopy is very useful for correlative imaging to label specific organelles or objects of interest and the two data sets can then be superimposed to get more information on the structure as well as the function and this can help for example to understand the mode of infection of a virus or the effect of a new therapeutic drug on cells. Super resolution microscopy would be even more useful in this case since with the x-ray tomograms we can get up to 25 nanometer resolution. Diffraction limited light microscopy can only image up to a few hundred nanometers in resolution. So high resolution would mean we can clearly identify the exact structures more accurately. But cryofluorescence microscopes are only recently becoming developed for super-resolution techniques. Cryoimaging does come at a resolution cost, because currently there's no easily available cryoimmersion objectives available. So we have to use air objectives. At the B24 beamline, a 3D cryosim microscope has been built in collaboration with the Micron Advanced Bioimaging Unit at the University of Oxford. SIM, or Structured Illumination Microscopy, is a type of super-resolution imaging technique that can double the normal resolution. And here at Diamond, we've combined this with a cryostage to hold vitrified samples on TEM grids to allow 3D cryosim imaging. The advantages of Structured Illumination Microscopy over other super-resolution techniques are that we can image thicker samples, over 10 microns in thickness, we also don't need to use very intense illumination, so there's less chance of causing sample damage. And we don't need to use any kind of special blinking fluorophores. Any conventional stains can be used. And these advantages make it particularly suited to use in combination with X-ray tomography, since we're imaging whole cells and we also need to preserve the cell structure for imaging in the X-ray microscope. Here's an example of a cryosim Z stack of a U2OS cell. This is an overview of the workflow at B24. On the experimental side, the samples will be prepared and then vitrified, and so they can then be imaged and then they can be analysed. 
So firstly, the cells will be grown on TEM grids. We use gold grids with a carbon coating. And we use finder grids so we can easily locate the same areas in different modalities. The samples can then be fluorescently labelled and we also label them with gold nanoparticles and these act as fiducials for um, alignment before the reconstruction of the tomograms. Then the samples are vitrified by plunge freezing in liquid ethane. After that, the samples are mapped, so we can take a whole montage image of the whole grid, and this will allow us to check the distribution of the cells and the fluorescence and make sure that the samples are suitable for imaging in cryosim and in SXT. After that, they can then be imaged in the cryosim. This is the cryosim microscope at B24. And after that, the samples can be transferred to the X-ray microscope. On the in silico side, the data sets will be reconstructed and then we can correlate them, which will be the focus of this talk. And then we can do further analysis like segmentation and quantification. Before I show you the correlation protocol, I'll explain some of the bottlenecks that we've encountered whilst developing this workflow and how we're working on optimizing it. Since this is a user facility, it's important to make sure that our processes are user friendly and easily reproducible. For example, we've worked on um, optimizing the fiducial distribution to make sure that they're not clumped. We also ensure that the samples are handled carefully so the grid stays flat during imaging. We've also developed scripts to allow automatic acquisition of a mosaic image as you can see in this video, and this can be done for both in the cryosim and in the X-ray microscope, so we can get a bright field image of a large area of the TEM grid. We're also using open source software for chromatic shift and stage shift correction, and we've also recently developed batch tomogram imaging, where we can uh, allow the tomograms to be collected automatically by just selecting some areas on the X-ray mosaic images. On the in silico side, we have also optimized the uh, reconstruction of the SIM images. So this means that we collect optical transfer functions every few months to make sure that there's no artifacts caused in the SIM reconstruction. There's also automatic reconstruction of the tomograms. So as soon as the tilt series data is collected in the X-ray microscope, this is automatically reconstructed and Micron has also developed a SimCheck plugin for image J and this allows you to check whether or not you have any reconstruction artifacts in your Sim images. On the correlation side, we've worked with the developer of ECCLEM, Dr. Perrine Porgiloto, and she's developed a protocol specifically for correlating SXT and fluorescent data sets. And on the segmentation side, we're looking into using open source software. So now I'll show you the image correlation protocol. These two images aren't required for actual correlation, but it's useful in the uh, experimental side. So these are the, the mosaic bright field images, which are taken firstly in the cryosim, and these red boxes show the areas where we've done cryosim imaging. And then we can transfer the sample and do the same in the cryo-SXT and locate the same areas. These are the images that you'll need for correlation. It helps to have all of these in one folder so you can easily start the registration process. From the cryosim microscope, we'll have bright field Z stacks as well as the structured illumination Z stack. And then on the X-ray microscope side, we'll have the reconstructed X-ray tomogram and also a 2D X-ray mosaic image, which shows a larger field of view uh, of one of the TEM uh, grid boxes, and these boxes show locations where we've taken X-ray tomograms. This is an overview of each step in the correlation process. We'll first use a set of 2D registrations, and these are then combined into a 3D transformation matrix. This can then be applied to the SIM 3D image Z stack and after that we'll register the stacks in Z. 
So this is the first step where the 2D transformations are done. And for this, the Z stacks need to be converted to 2D. And this can be done either by extracting a slice from the Z stack or doing a minimum or maximum intensity projection in the Z direction. So for the first step in the registration, we'll correlate the SIM image with the bright field image. And both taken in the same microscope. So we'll place fiducial markers and then update EC Clem and on the right you can see the merged image. This is then done again with the bright field image and the x-ray mosaic. For fiducial markers we'll use things such as the fiducial gold nanoparticles that we added or any of the high contrast cellular features such as lipid droplets We'll also look for cracks in the ice or any foreign objects such as dust particles which can be seen in both images or features of the grid such as these support film holes. And this is finally done again using the x-ray mosaic image and the x-ray tomogram. This generates a set of XML files which uh, have the transformation in them and this can then be combined into a 3D transformation schema. This can also be done in EC Clem. And this schema can now be applied to the original SIM image, so we can then transform and crop the SIM image to the same resolution as the X-ray tomogram. We can also use this transformation schema but invert it and use a new plugin that Perrine's developed called Correlative View to put the tomogram on the SIM image so we can see where it was collected. So now the image is registered in the XY direction and the 2D transformation is unambiguous. So we don't need to worry about the 2D anymore. But it's not aligned yet in the Z direction. So now we need to use the SIM image and tomogram to use the EC Clem again and we can correlate the image this way. So once this transformation is done, then the two data sets can be merged. This is a step that beginners might find useful if you're finding it difficult to find the same locations in the two different images, especially if it's rotated and flipped. For example, here between the X-ray mosaic and the bright field image, it can be very difficult to locate the same exact cells. <clears throat> so what we do is we place fiducial markers in the center of nuclei which are very easily locatable. So here we've placed the red and blue markers in between these two nuclei, then we placed one in between the junction of these two cell nuclei. And then we can update the transformation and compare the two images on the left and the right, and now you can much more clearly identify the same structures in the image. So then you can zoom in and reposition the original markers to more accurate locations and also place more accurate fiducial markers. So now I'll show you some example studies of what can be achieved with this correlation protocol. This is the same data set after correlation and it's part of a recently published study from our group on Rio virus. Rio virus is an established experimental model for studying viral pathogenesis and it's also being researched for anti-cancer treatments. However, it wasn't yet known how this virus is able to reach the cytoplasm to start replicating. These are U2OS cells which are fluorescent and they express galactin 3 in red. And this is a way of telling which endosomes have disrupted cell membranes. The cells were also infected with a fluorescently labelled Rio virus in green. And here we found vesicles that were carrying the virus, which also co-localised with galactin-3, confirming that they had disrupted cell membranes. We also found that the virus was first found in spherical vesicles about one hour after infection, and then they develop into multivesicular bodies whilst they move towards the nucleus about three hours after infection. So this correlative imaging approach enabled us to identify a clear timeline of how long it takes the virus to escape and how it's transported in the cell. 
This type of data couldn't have easily been acquired with any other imaging modalities. So this was a snapshot of what can be achieved with the techniques and the correlative workflow. But how do you make sure that you collect good data to make the correlation easier? In this final section, I'll give some tips which will help. These are some key parts of the workflow which need to be optimized, optimized for easier correlation. For example, it's important to have a good fiducial distribution and to have optimal cell density. Cell density is important for the X-ray imaging. If there's too many cells that are clustered together, then the sample won't be able to blot properly and it will be too thick. If there's too sparse cells, then we won't be able to find enough areas to image. So the optimum cell density looks like what you can see in the image in the middle, where there are clusters of cells, but they're also nicely distributed. So we can blot and we can easily image and locate the same areas. The amount of blotting that's needed before plunge freezing is also important. It is sample dependent, but it's important to not have too little blotting as this would mean that the ice is too thick and this could form ice crystals. And too much blotting may mean that the sample is too thin, so it could be susceptible to radiation damage. We found in this case for the influenza project that the optimal blotting is when we can see this this sort of meniscus around the TEM grid bars. And this is a, a sign of good blotting in our case, but it is sample dependent. It's also important to minimize the formation of ice crystals. Ice crystals can obscure the field of view as we found in this experiment where we firstly imaged in the cryosim where we're, there were lots of nice areas to image. But then when we transferred the sample into the X-ray microscope, there were loads of ice crystals that formed which completely blocked the areas that we just imaged. In this case, this happened because we left the sample in the cryosim for too long. Uh, so there were ice crystals which formed from the moisture in the air. But this can also happen if the liquid nitrogen that's used isn't filtered properly or if it's left too long after filtering. You can also try to minimize the, the damage or caused by this ice crystal formation by taking images in the cryosim in areas that are not just clustered in one particular area on the grid but spread about on the grid. So if ice crystals do form then you'll still have other areas where you can image. It's also important to choose areas carefully when you image them in the cryosim because they might look perfectly fine especially under fluorescence but they wouldn't be suitable for imaging in the X-ray microscope. For example, cracks in the ice, which you can't see in the fluorescence images, so it's important to check the bright field images as well. These can't be imaged properly in the X-ray microscope. Also, you don't want to image where the cell's far too close to the grid bars because then you won't be able to get a very high angle of rotation in the X-ray microscope. And it's also important not to image near any any damage to the grids. So on the right you can see good areas for imaging where we can see cells towards the center of the grid bars and they're distributed well and there's no damage. It's also important to choose the fiducials carefully. In this case I'm referring to the fiducials that we use uh, for choosing in the correlation process in ECLEM. And it depends on what you want to image in the cell. For example, if you want to image a process near the nucleus, then it would be good to use the mitochondria as fiducials. However, if you want to image something that's outside of the cell, then it may be useful to use fluorescent nanoparticles, as you can see in green in this video. However, these nanoparticles, you can see they're not very well distributed. So that's also something that would need to be optimized. So in summary, we've shown two methods for high resolution cellular imaging, cryosoft x-ray tomography, which can visualize cellular substructures in fully hydrated cells without needing to fix or stain them, 
cryostructured illumination microscopy, which we've chosen to use in conjunction with cryo-SXT since it can also image whole cells with relatively low light doses and using conventional fluorophores. We've shown an easy to use protocol for correlating these two datasets using the open source ECCLEM software. And we've also given suggestions to take into account during the experimental process, which will help with easier correlation. And we've demonstrated how this correlative workflow can be useful for studying virus transport in cells and identifying cellular organelles, and it can have many other applications. For future work, we'll focus on automation of the processes, such as for reconstruction and segmentation, and we'll also be working into looking into automated registration techniques. We'd also like to use this in conjunction with other modalities such as electron tomography and other microscopies. In conclusion, we've shown how data from CryoSXT and CryoSim can be processed and correlated to give 3D image volumes showing both chemical localization and ultrastructural organization. And by combining these two cutting edge imaging methods, we hope to enable further exciting breakthroughs in cellular processes. Finally, I'd like to thank all of the B24 team and our collaborators and funders, especially Ian and Mick who built the Cryosim system, Irvin and John who we're working with for the Influenza project, Angus and Clarissa who we're working with on the Cilia project, as well as Perrine who's developed ECCLEM and helped us with the correlation. Thank you very much.